All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this month's Systems Thinking Ontario, uh, titled Population Growth and Ecological Sustainability, something that's continuing perhaps a thread uh, from the last event. Um, so yeah, we have Madeline Well joining us today and she'll be sharing a presentation on this and then we'll have some discussions. As is custom with Systems Thinking Ontario, we'd like to spend a few minutes of just letting everyone introduce themselves. Um, so for this one, you can just briefly describe your, you know, introduce yourself as your name, uh, where you're calling in from, and if you've researched or connected population dynamics to systems or population to uh, systems thinking in any way, and how that might be of interest to you. So I'll just call out the names and we can, we can go from there. So I'm just going to look at up on my screen, uh, Peter Jones. So I'll, uh, thank you, Zed. I'll go first. I'm Peter Jones, a professor at OCAD University, teaching in graduate programs only. A, uh, uh, I'm a co-founder of Systemic Design Association and have been involved in, in developing uh, the literature and the, uh, and the uh, conferences through the Relating Systems Thinking and Design Conference, which is now in its 12th year. Um, and... I think I know uh, most of the people in in here, except maybe the presenter. So, hello, Madeline. Yeah, um, who would like to go next? I'll I'll just call out the the next name on the list. And um, so, yeah, Richard Richard Knowles. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Richard Knowles. I'm calling in from Youngstown, New York, which is just across the Niagara River from Niagara on the Lake. I can see you guys downtown across the lake on a clear day. <clears throat> I've been studying systems and complexity and chaos for many years and working with people around the issues of leadership and industrial safety and eliminating workplace violence. And these are all interrelated subjects because they're all about people. So I've been learning a lot about the ecological situation recently, and I'm interested to learn from all of you about the things that you'll be able to share. And uh, I've gotten to know Peter over the last few years, and uh, he, he actually wrote about my work in one of the chapters of his new book, which I found quite a thrill. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Richard. Nice to, nice to have you. Uh, Donald, Donald Officer. Don needs Donald, to... I, I just, uh, yeah, I just clicked the unmute. For some reason. Sorry. Yes, okay, there we go. I've been interested in systems for uh, quite a long time. Uh, I haven't progressed as far as I would like because uh, a lot of reasons. There are other things happening, I guess. That's partly it. Right now I'm involved in a, a, a study, I guess, that uh, is more in, involved with complexity. But it seems to be a, a major obstacle to a lot of systems work. And uh, I would be interested in anyone who could uh, point me to any insights in that direction. Awesome. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. Um, David Hawk. What should I say, David? I am a farmer in Iowa <laughs> near the southeast corner of the Iowa border yeah. and uh, uh, yeah I hang around here and entertain lots of guests that come through um, I guess recently they're mostly Chinese now that it's easy for them to travel again oh. but uh, but yeah it seems fine and the government reinstated my permanent visa to China which okay. they suspended for a few years. Uh, I started a foundation there, which David knows about, called the Foundation for the Eternal Feminine, having to do with how to replace men as leaders. And in that I blamed industrialization on men and industrialization, the kind we pursued, is a major problem for many things. And so you can't count on men to fix it. So I argued that we should allow the feminine values that's not men versus women. Of course, it's 
a masculine versus feminine because there are a lot of feminine men around just like there's a lot of masculine women mm. so anyway i started this foundation which uh, i think three or four years later it had about a billion dollars behind it from various company leaders that had daughters and no sons and mm. they were they were quite strong advocates of it anyway in fall of 2021 the uh spiritual leader of china closed down the foundation and uh hmm. said with gave a speech uh in chinese uh on how what china needed was more masculinity not less hmm. and so he gave his masculinity speech and closed the foundation so uh i'm sort of out of work uh unemployable and uh trying to find my way in the world Every now and then David helps me, but that's about it. He gets pissed off and leaves me too. But uh, it, uh, it, it's fine. I Sitting here in this facility I built, four stories, about 8,000 square feet. And uh, uh, we seem to have meetings and other sorts of things here. But uh, I, I built it myself because I like building things. But uh, Thank you. Anyway, I, I work against many things that we'll probably talk about today. Yeah. Thank you, David. That's good to hear. Um, next on the list is Elena. Elena Leonard. Uh, hi, um, Elena Leonard here in downtown Toronto. Uh, I've been involved in cybernetics and systems since the 80s, mostly working with viable system model and team's integrity process. And I think I can stop there. Nice, short and sweet. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Stephen, Stephen. Um, yes, um, yes. Uh, I'm I'm an academic. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus in uh, computer studies at Trent University. Um, I came to systems through um, um, the history of ideas, uh, the history and philosophy of science and technology. And in particular, I liked uh, Kenneth Boulding and Anatole Rappaport. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you, Stephen. Um, where was I? Bev, Bev Friedman? On mute. I figured that. Thank you. Sorry. Um, hi, I'm um, in Toronto. Um, I am a former student of Peter Jones, and he got me fired up and really excited about systems. So um, it's thanks to Peter. And I'm, uh, I don't work in it in any way, shape or form, but I, it, I'm fascinated by systems. So again, thanks to Peter. Um, that's who I am. Thank you, Bev. Uh, yeah, Peter is a good rallying point for systems in the community. So we always appreciate him. Um, next up is Kelly on the list. Meaning me? Yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm I'm Kelly Okamura. I'm calling in from Toronto. Um, I also came in through uh, via Peter Jones, and I'm basically learning systems through the back door. Uh, part of uh, learning with David Ng as well as with Elena on systems. And I think that that's perfectly true. Once you go into systems, then you can't think differently. So it's made my life really complicated. So I'm very happy to also be learning uh, with David Hawk. Mm. I'm very interested in the population growth aspect as well. So I'm looking forward to the talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Griff? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Griff uh, calling in from Guelph, Ontario, PhD student at the University of Waterloo, uh, pretty involved with Creative Commons Canada. Been uh, around this community for a number of years now, I think originally through David, the one and only. Um, and my connection to the topic this evening is that I did my undergraduate uh, degree in international development. And that would have been like almost 20 years ago now, which is <laughs> shocking but um 
uh, at that time, there was a shift happening. I, I detected around conversations happening with like population and growth um, internationally and, and nationally as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and the shift sort of aligns with some of what you outlined uh, in your in your talk this evening. So yeah, curious to see where you go with it. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, I was going to jump, we have one person that's just joined, Joanne, we're just doing brief intros about where you're calling in from and what your interest is, is in the topic. I don't know if you can hear me or see me. <laughs> we can, we can hear and see you. Oh, okay, excellent. I, I can't see myself in, uh, I'm calling in from a phone so I can see myself. Um, I'm a student uh, at OCAD U studying strategic foresight and innovation. And um, I was a student of Peter Jones and I'm keenly interested in sustainability but through the lens of textiles. So a little bit uh, different than, than perhaps this topic, but uh, it, it's something that I've been very passionate about for a long time. So I look forward to hearing your, what you have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. Nice, nice to have you here. Um, second last, David Ng. Hi, uh, David Ng, um, hanging around. Then this is like, it's weird to be putting up system thinking Ontario announcements when it's like a hundred plus meetings we've been having is like a long time. Um, so I'm interested in population growth as the slow thing that no one's paying attention to. Um, I've been watching it for a while, um, very conscious about uh, how it's not equally distributed around the world. Awesome, thank you, David. And for myself, my name is Zad Khan. I'm calling in from Ottawa actually. Um, I'm not at my home base, so there's some family noise in the background. So I'll remind myself, and that may serve as a reminder to you all during the presentation, just as a logistics thing, if we could go on mute as Madeline presents, and then we can we can turn that back on when we get into discussion points. You might hear some of my nephews crying in the background or something. And on a second logistics point, um, around 7.50, I just have to take off. So we'll have a host switch. Uh, in the Zoom version where David Ng will come in and take over uh, hosting. But um, because I'm in Ottawa, I've actually had the chance to meet with Madeline before. So I, I connected, or my background is that I come to systems also from SFI. I'm a graduate of Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program, where Dr. Peter Jones kind of also uh, instilled an enthusiasm for systems. I've also connected with David Ng through the program, and I work with him collaboratively and Kelly and the team on Systems Changes Learning, which takes a look. Uh, a uh, processual like, look uh, at systems changes. And I can I heard about the Population Growth Institute, uh, Population Institute of Canada, and Madeline happened to be in Ottawa, and I've connected with her. We went for a nice walk and talk, and I thought that this topic might be of interest to the Systems Thinking Ontario community. Um, she's presented at a Canadian Association for the Club of Rome and some other venues as well, where these topics are of interest. Um, I won't go too into too much detail introducing Madeline, I'll let her do that um, herself, but she's uh, she's retired from Health Canada where she served uh, for a number of years and now she is the president at the Population Institute of Canada. So Madeline, over to you if you wanna introduce yourself and you can kick off the presentation as well. Okay, sure. Um, my name is, is Madeline Weld and uh, thank you all for inviting me. So my background is in biology. I have a degree in zoology from the University of Guelph and master's and PhD in physiology from Louisiana State University. Um, my, was, I've been interested in population pretty much all my life. My dad was a diplomat and when I was very young and just short of um, turning five, we were sent to, um, the year was late 1959, we're sent to Rio, which was the capital of Brazil. And I was there for about two and a half, three years. Um, Later on in 1965, my dad was posted to uh, Pakistan for two years, and later we were in Switzerland. So we're, from a very early age, I mean, I, I saw these things, and we traveled around while we were in, in those different countries. Um, I saw, you know, the difference, the, the rich and the poor, especially it really struck me when I was a very young child in, in Rio, um, the contrast in comparison to, you know, what I saw in Ottawa, which is mostly middle-class people. Um, and I, I really got to thinking about population, I think, before I was five. 
<laughs> and I've been thinking about it all my life, I guess, since then. Uh, Population Institute Canada was founded in 1992 under a different name by retired engineer Whitman Wright. And I joined pretty much when it was founded. And then um, for various reasons and other commitments Whitman had, I became chair of the organization in 1995 and have been the chair or president ever since. <laughs> so um, I'm still waiting for that coup, but it hasn't happened yet, coup d'etat. Anyway, um, so today's presentation is gonna be um, mostly about um, Canada. I mean, that's where the focus is, but I'd certainly, in the discussion, we can talk about whatever comes up in the discussion. Um, my argument is going to be that, um, well, well, population, like, I guess I, I have had no connection to systems thinking, although I think I've been thinking in terms of systems about population um, without really knowing it, <laughs> without really knowing it. Um, okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and start then, uh, Zad. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, um, Population growth and ecological sustainability. I say that the first undermines the second. Um, so I'm going to look at some basic numbers. Um, the population is affected by both the fertility rate and mortality rate and by immigration and emigration. Um, so looking at Canada's population growth by 10-year censuses from 1851 to 2011, couldn't find a graph that went to 2021, 20, uh, but starting at 2.4 million in 1851, we're up to 33.5 million in 2011. And we are very close to in 2021, if we, if we had the data from that census, we'd be very close to the 40 million mark. We're about 39.5 right now. So, the, and you can see it's been growing very, very rapidly in the more recent years. So while this growth has been happening, the total fertility rate in Canada has been falling. Um, in 1860, uh, the average woman had close to six kids. Um, in 20, well, in 2023, it's 1.4 kids. Uh, there was a, it's been going steadily down, as you can see from 1860. This dip here, uh, 1935 is, um, well, during the depression, the birth rate went down a bit more. And then there was kind of a a boom, the, the baby boom post-war. And um, that's the boom I was born inside. And um, then since then it's been going down. So, okay. And then we look at the number of um, immigrants. This is the absolute numbers of immigrants who've been coming to Canada from 1852 to 2014. So you can see that the numbers varied enormously in the 1800s, there were, you know, some tens of thousands. There was a bit of a, a boom in the, the late 18, uh, 1880s to 1890s, and then it went way down. Um, and then the, um, there was a huge, massive increase in, in about 1911, um, which is when the prairies were being settled, and lots and lots came in, and then it plummeted again. Um, went up a little bit before in the 20s plummeted during the depression, like after the depression, it went way down. And then um, following the war, it, the Second World War, it went up a bit, but it still went up and down. And then in 1990, uh, under Brian Mulroney's conservative government, it was announced that uh, henceforth, there would be 250,000 or more immigrants each year, regardless of economic conditions. And in a, a astonishing candor, one of the reasons given by Immigration Minister Barbara McDougall was to get more votes for the Conservative Party because most immigrants were voting for the Liberals. I don't think we'd see such honesty these days, but anyway. So you can see that the the numbers of immigrants varied very widely. Um, they had peaks and troughs, sort of a tap on, tap off approach. So if you look at um, what percentage of the population is made up of immigrants, it, it goes up consistently, which isn't surprising despite the variations because uh, an immigrant is, you know, he arrives one year, but every year after that would still be counted as an immigrant until in every census until um, that person would die. So during the big boom, uh, the big immigrant intake in 1911, we can see that um, that brought the, the pr proportion or the percentage of immigrants up to about 22 percent. And that was only reached again um, recently 
2021 um, be, because of the large increase in, in immigration since the 1990s. So uh, it, as it says here, nearly one um, in four people in Canada are immigrates, immigrants, the largest proportion in more than 150 years. Right. So this is from a, a newspaper, or a Huffington Post article, and it just shows the proportion, the contribution of immigration to population growth from 1990, which is, you know, po during Mulroney's uh, era, to 2017, and it went from about 45% to, it was 75% in 2017, but it's, it's more now. And this is a, a slide that Zad found for me, and I, I had it in table form, but it's just so great to have it as a, as a graph. So this shows the, um, compares the, the intercensal population, the growth, the growth of the contribution through natural increase, which is in green, and the contribution through immigration, which is in blue. And just so you, in case you're wondering what this pale blue is, that is when Newfoundland joined um, Canada in 1949. So that's a one-off uh, contribution there. But you can see that the green is much more prevalent than the blue until recent years. So Canada's population, despite having very high levels of intake, like even here for the 20, uh, for the 1911, 1901 to 11 census, when that huge number of immigrants came in, natural increase was still bigger than the, uh, the input of, from natural increase was still bigger than from immigration. And here during the late 1800s, you can see that immigration actually made a negative contribution to population growth, meaning that more people left Canada than arrived in Canada because some of the uh, arrivals would find out that Canada's a very cold place, hard to make a living, um, ever spend a winter in the prairies. <laughs> so it, it, so quite a few of them left and it was only, and also in the 30s during the depression, you can see that there's a small negative contribution from immigration. But then here in recent years, um, you can see it's almost all, well, this is projection here, but even like the, the latest um, shows that immigration is making about 80% or more of the contribution to population growth. And this is on, of course, on a much larger population base than back a century ago. So um, a little bit of a summary, Canada's had a total fertility rate uh, at or below the replacement level of 2.1 children per woman since 1972. With balanced migration, that is if um, immigration were just used to replace emigration, Canada's population would have stabilized at about 27 million. With current immigration policies, we're close to 40 million and counting. Um, Canada does not have an official population policy, but it does have policies that affect population and the primary one by far is immigration. Other policies such as um, incentivizing fertility with a baby bonus has not had a major impact. And I don't think it's had a persistent major impact in any country that's tried it, even, even Russia. So policies are based on premises. And so Canada's immigration policy, which is basically its population policy, is based on premises, and these are some of the assumptions on which the policies are based. We're a big country with lots of room for more people. I've heard that before. Um, we as a country are defined by immigration. Immigrants built Canada. Uh, we need immigrants for labor shortages. Immigration will offset Canada's low fertility rate and rejuvenate it. And we must continually grow the population, uh, the economy. We must grow the economy, and that includes growing the population because it's GDP over everything. So on the premise that um, Canada is a big country with lots of room for more people, Canada does have a large surface area. And if you exclude all the lakes and everything and just the land, it's about just over 9 million square kilometers and a population of nearly 39 million. So the population density, according to my math, comes out to about 4.26 people per square kilometer. But how accurate is that? So this is a map of Canada, as you can see, and we've got a, a red line here, which starts um, 
near Manitoulin Island and Georgian Bay, sort of the north end of Georgian Bay. And then if you just keep going east, it, Maine sticks its nose into Canada a bit there, but um, it then crosses over and gets half about half of New Brunswick, uh, half of Nova Scotia. It misses most of New Brunswick, but gets about half of Nova Scotia. And this map includes the um, the biggest cities, which is Toronto, oops, um, Ottawa and Montreal are just below the red line there. So this, when you think of it, like 50% of Canadians live in that tiny area of Canada. Another way to look at it is to say 70% of Canadians live in the, the colored areas. The red is the, um, the Quebec City to Windsor corridor along the southern part of Quebec and Ontario. The blue in Alberta is the uh, Calgary Edmonton corridor. And the green is the greater Vancouver area. Um, so 30% of people live in the rest of Canada, the gray area of Canada. So again, you can see we're very, very concentrated in certain areas. In fact, in Ontario, 93% um, of the population live on like the 16% of the land that is this southern part. So this is uh, an, another way of looking at it. The dotted yellow line is the 49th parallel, which is known for being the border between the US and Canada. But of course, that only applies on the Canadian territory to the Ontario Manitoba border. Um, and then you see that most of the populated part of Canada is, is south of that. So Seattle, actually, which is um, 47 degrees north, is north of, of Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. So uh, Seattle has a population of over 700,000. And I know these, the northern parts, well, these states are not the most densely populated. So there might not be too many people there, but at least uh, over 700,000 people in, in Americans live north of 70% of Canadians, which is interesting. I don't know if most people have thought of things in that way. Um, so, so Canada is a big country, but it doesn't really have lots of room for more people because it doesn't say anything about how much of it is suitable for human habitations, habitation. And most Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border for a reason that's not likely to change soon. I mean, Antarctica is a big continent too, but not too many people live there. Um, so based on where Canadians actually live, um, which is also where immigrants go to live, you could easily multiply Canada's population density by 10, probably by much more than that, which would make it 42.6 people per square kilometer, which is more than the population density of the U.S., which is 36 people per square kilometer. So the another premise is we are a country, we as a country are defined by immigration and immigrants built Canada. Well, historically, there have been high levels of immigration, but there have also been low levels. They fluctuated wildly. It's only um, since 1990 under Brian Mulroney's government that very high targets were set annually. And this policy was continued by every government since then. Uh, Craig Kahn's government, Paul Martin's government, while it lasted, um, Harper's government continued it, even though they made some reform. And Trudeau's has just ramped it up a lot. So immigrants did build Canada, um, but does Canada need more building right now? Or is the habitable part already sufficiently densely populated? Um, maybe Canada was sufficiently built by 1950. The, the argument immigrants built Canada is often used to silence opponents of, of mass immigration. And I wanna emphasize that's not anti-immigrant, that's just, you know, like not having a large family isn't being anti-family, it's, just choosing you know, what, what you think is right for your family or for your country. So then there's the premise, we need immigrants for labor and skills shortages, which for me raises the question of why 30 plus years of extremely high immigration have apparently not alleviated those labor shortages. And I don't think they ever will. If we keep growing the population, we will need more builders, healthcare workers, workers in the trades, teachers, because there's gonna be more people. So there's gonna be more jobs that need filling. And if we have skill shortages, um, 
can we not train Canadians for, for most of them with possible rare exceptions to bring somebody special in? So the, the premise that immigration will offset Canada's low fertility rate and rejuvenate our aging population. There has not been a single study that supports that. There have been quite a few that um, negated and, and show that that actually doesn't do that. In 2006, the C.D. Howe Institute published a, a study called No Elixir of Youth, Immigration Cannot Keep Canada Young. And they pointed out that to keep the dependency ratio, that is people of working age uh, versus those um, under working age and 65 and over, we'd have to vastly increase our immigration and be taking in 7 million immigrants per year and our population would be 65 million. Now, in, in 2006, that sounded like crazy talk, but this is pretty much what the Century Initiative is, is promoting. Shirley Lowe and M.V. George um, wrote a paper in 2007 looking at the projected population size and age structure for Canada and, and the provinces with and without international migration. And they also found essentially no difference in the numbers. And Shirley Lowe um, at the time worked for Statistics Canada. Rod Bojo, a demographer, also looked at the effect of immigration on the Canadian population and found it didn't affect the age structure. Um, of course, current immigration is, is changing the ethnicity of Canada, but it's not doing anything for the age structure. So no study that I know of, um, and even Jason Kenney, when he was Im immigration minister under Harper, admitted that immigration is not changing the age structure. So... The premise, we must continually grow the economy, including by growing the population. And that we think we should ask the question, why is growth our holy grail? Because the adverse effects of growth now outweigh the benefits. Per capita wealth, as I will show, has not increased with growth and the distribution of wealth has become more skewed towards the wealthy. And I just like this quote by Kenneth Boulding, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And uh, Bill Maher in one of his, uh, in November last year, when the world reached the population of 8 billion, he had a, a show on it and he asked, um, since when has the concept of finiteness been abolished? Which I think is a good question. So, to the question of has growth benefited working Canadians, this is from the StatsCan 2006 census, and it looked at earnings and incomes of Canadians between 1980 and 2005, and it found that the median earnings of the top 20% for full-time workers increased by 16.4%, so the top 20% got richer. The median earnings among those of the bottom one-fifth fell by 20.6%. So they got poorer, and the median earnings among those in the middle 20% increased by only 0.1%, essentially no change. So essentially what happened in that quarter century is that the wealth was skewed more towards the wealthy. And also during that same past quarter century, the earnings gap between recent immigrants, uh, recent immigrant workers and Canadian-born workers widened. In 1980, recent immigrant men um, earned 85 cents for each dollar by Canadian born men. But by 2005, that ratio had dropped to 63 cents. And for women, it was even worse. It was 85 cents and 56 cents respectively. And the census, the StatsCan 2006 census also says that the disparities between recent immigrant workers and Canadian born workers increased not only during the two previous decades, but also between 2000 and 2005. So this um, chart shows how Canada's growth has affected workers and bankers differently. Workers pay more and bankers get more. So on the left, we see the house price index um, and we see that all of those colored lines are different cities. And we see that um, Hamilton actually has the lead and then Vancouver and Toronto in increasing house prices between um, 2000 and 2021. But every major city in Can in every major city in Canada, the, the price of houses has gone up significantly. Meanwhile, the total outstanding residential mortgages, the mortgages have become a huge part of the um, GDP, basically. And the, the residential mortgages re reached 100 and well, 
this is 1.8 trillion, so $1,800 billion <clears throat> up from under um, 300 billion in, in 1990. So the mortgage holders are doing, or the mortgage providers are doing well, the people paying the mortgage are paying quite a bit more. One of the things, one of the problems with this um, population growth, which makes houses, uh, well, we've got a housing crisis right now, is, is asset inflation. Like goods like houses become more and more valuable and unaffordable. This shows, this graph shows household debt in Canada from um, 1998 and 2022, which has increased, well, it's close to doubled. And if, if you went back farther in time, it would be an even a greater increase. I think in, in the last 50 years, it, debt has quintupled. So there's been a huge increase in debt. So that's, you know, not really good for the working Canadian either. Then two mainstream economists, Herb Grubel and Patrick Grady, calculated the cost of recent immigrants. And this, this is their last figures from 2014. And they figured it cost, uh, um, recent immigrants cost the Canadian government 30 to 35 billion more in benefits than they paid in taxes each year. And that's because recent immigrants received the same services as resident Canadians and sometimes more if they need language training or something. But because they earn less, they pay less in taxes. And these mainstream economists didn't look at um, any anything ecological. They just looked at economics. The job quality for many Canadians has decreased. In uh, 2017, when Trudeau's government announced the first uh, massive increase in immigration, his immigration minister, Bill Morneau, said young Canadians face a job churn. So debt has also increased. The cost of education has increased and housing has become less affordable. <clears throat> The increased tax base does not offset the cost of servicing new suburbs. So everybody's municipal taxes keep going up. At least they do here in Ottawa. So, and then there are the environmental costs of growth. Um, this is from Statistics Canada data from 2001. But, but at that time, that uh, document said, urban uses have consumed 12,000 square kilometers of land since 1971. One half of this was dependable farmland, um, classes one, two, three. There's six classes of farmland. And basically, class six is only good for grazing or something. So the, the best three classes, well, one, two, three. 50% um, of Canada's best farmland is located in Ontario, most in the heavily urbanized southern part. And by 2001, over 18% of that class one farmland had been converted to urban purposes. And if, right now, the Ontario Farmland Trust says that Ontario is still losing 319 acres of farmland each day. So there's also the impact on ecosystems. And I see the typo I have there. Um, so there are now a total of 829 animal and plant species in various uh, COSAWIC, which is Committee on the Study of Endangered Wildlife in Canada risk category. So this is, um, I think this is 2022 data, maybe it's 2021, but 363 endangered, 190 threatened, 235 special concern, and 22 species are no longer found in the wild in Canada. And over 72% of Southern Ontario's wetlands have been lost to agriculture or development since 1800. And the native prairie grasslands are one of the most endangered ecosystems on uh, earth, apparently. So how has um, Premier Doug Ford responded to the growth that is being imposed by, by federal immigration policies? Um, because uh, about half of new immigrants go to Ontario and of those, that half, about three quarters settle in the greater Toronto area. So he has not challenged um, the growth, but he has challenged, you know, he has basically decided that no part of Ontario is going to be safe from development. He has given this bill, 23, gives the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing the power to override municipal planning decisions and impose development. It eliminates the requirement for public meetings for certain developments and therefore deprives individuals and groups the opportunity to oppose them. 
um, and it strips conservation authorities of some of their traditional powers regarding development. Like if they said it was too close to a wetland or a river or a stream or something, they they could do something, but apparently they're not gonna have that power for much longer. A Bill 39, um, Better Municipal Governments Act, Governance Act, amends previous acts um, to give the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa and some other municipalities the authority to propose bylaws with only one third of the city council vote. So that's the strong mayor's um, act or bill. And the strong mayor's building better homes and regulations, it supports the amendments um, that bill 39 makes um, to, and these are the two acts, city of Toronto 2006 municipal act 2001. That gives mayors more power, more veto power, ability to appoint or dismiss chief administrative officers. So that just gets rid of um, a lot of resistance that if municipalities don't want to build as fast as, as the city or, or as the um, Ontario government or the mayor of that city wants to, they'll just be able to override them more easily. And probably everyone has heard of the Highway 413 that is being proposed um, in the uh, Northwest around the GTA. So, uh, are, well, are there any scientific studies supporting a continually growing population? Um, all of the ones I've encountered say no. In 1976, um, the Science Council of Canada, which was disbanded under Mulroney, but it's, it's report number 25 called Population Technology and Resources, advised against um, pushing population growth too rapidly and, uh, you know, mentioned that resources are finite and that sort of thing. The Intelligence Advisory Committee um, of 1991 is a confidential document that I got uh, through access to information eventually, and it, it looked at um, the situation in the world of the in different countries, um, population um, and environment, and it also considered population to be a, a threat uh, because of resource scarcity and climate change it mentioned. And then in um, 1997, Michael Healy and UBC scientists published the Fraser Basin Ecosystem Study, which had been supported by the federal government. And they said that the Fraser Basin was already three times over a sustainable level back in 1997. I think it's grown quite a bit since then. Um, so there's no, no scientific study that promotes um, population growth. Enormous growth solved any problems. It hasn't made city infrastructure easier to maintain or help traffic pollution, social services, or, or crime. And so then it raises the question of what metrics are used to show that a growing population increases the quality of life? Has, has population growth actually increased anybody's quality of life? Well, G, GDP has grown, but per capita wealth has not grown, and certainly not average per capita wealth. Happiness levels do not increase in a big city. Housing has become less affordable. Access to nature has been reduced. Debt levels are much higher. Um, equality levels are much lower. We used to be in, in second place for equality, and now we're in the mid-30s, and job quality has declined. This is a graph my friend uh, John Mayer of Canadians for a Sustainable Society made. It shows different cities and the rate of growth, which is um, blue and blue, and you can see that a berry just went nuts in terms of the amount of growth it's got versus the reported life satisfaction. Um, it does not really go up with growth, and he made a linear line showing it actually goes down. And this is supported by Alberta's Genuine Progress Indicator, or GPI, System of Sustainable Wellbeing Accounts. They looked at what happened between 1961 and 1999 when Alberta's rose, uh, GDP rose by 2.4% annually, but its GPI pretty much fell and, or stagnated. It, it did not rise in conjunction with a growing GDP. And the European study from a few, uh, well, 2020 shows that biodiversity, biological diversity actually evokes happiness. And they compared life satisfaction as reported by individuals with the number of bird species in their vicinity. And they found that a 10% increase in, in the number of bird species increased uh, the Europeans' life satisfaction as much as a comparable increase in income. 
So they conclude nature conservation thus constitutes an investment in human well-being. And I think you can think of it as a form of wealth if you live in a, a nice um, biodiverse neighborhood. Whoops. Um, so then the question is, why are we still pushing growth? Um, at 20 million in 1967, which was Canada's centennial, it was a built country. It had all the amenities of modern life. It had done well in two world wars, was a leader in aviation and nuclear science, and its publicly funded healthcare system was working well. And even if we make allowances for in, uh, advances in research and diagnosis, it seems that Canadians had fewer mental health problems. And so could Canadians be suffering from population density stress like the rodents in John Calhoun's studies? Um, I won't talk about him much, but he was um, back in, I think, about 1947 or something. He was supposed to uh, deal with the rat problem in the city of Baltimore. And um, he ended up for a few decades doing studies on rodent population density. And he found that even if you built, uh, you know, utopias with all the food and water and everything they needed, at a certain population density there, they they started to go a little bit bizarre in their behavior. Um, so this brings us to the, the growth pushers. Who are the growth pushers? Well, some of them are politicians like Brian Mulroney and Justin Trudeau. Um, they hope to benef benefit through the ballot box um, from a policy of mass immigration. And uh, Mulroney's immigration minister actually said as much. Um, then there's also the Century Initiative, founded by Dominic Bartman and Mark Wiseman. Sorry, Dominic Barton and Mark Wiseman. And it wants a population of 100 million by 2100. Why? The Century Initiative seems to be the de facto immigration policymaker under Trudeau. Um, and I can talk about why I think that. And speculators, developers, bankers, cheap labor businesses, and media corporations. And there's there's other you know, profiteers of growth and they, they want growth. Um, so why does the Century Initiative want 100 million Canadians? Well, to increase the GDP, that, that's a prime reason, um, but the answer to that is on a finite planet, growth eventually has to stop and better to prepare you know, for a soft landing if possible than a crash. They also say Canada would play a bigger role on the world stage. Well, I think Canada's doing okay. Um, it sounds like size envy, and Canada was doing fine with a smaller population. Um, and then to counter an, an aging population is their other argument, but growth has not affected Canada's age structure, so that is a, a bogus argument. You know, might corruption be involved in the mad pursuit of growth? Follow the money. Well, developers are major contributors to winning municipal politicians. A, a study in the early 2000s by um, Robert McDermott showed that winning municipal politicians in Toronto, 70% of their funding came from developers. And the Ontario government doesn't even try to hide its support of developers. Um, politicians don't seem to understand that you need farmland to grow food. And Canadian media corporations are mostly owned and influenced by investment houses and hedge funds. And the mainstream media a few years ago received $600 million bailout from the federal government. They don't really question the government's immigration policies. So what would a responsible immigration policy look like? Um, well, it would put the interests of working Canadians first, I would say. It should replace the goal of growth at all costs with the goal of human well-being and environmental sustainability. It would conserve Canada's ability to produce its own food and not pave over farmland. And it would contribute to building a nation and not just a bigger economic market. Um, Canada can't solve the world's population pr problem through immigration. What can it do? Well, it can make family planning a significant integral part of foreign aid. It can um, share, in addition to material help, it can share knowledge and expertise on sustainability issue. It can reward countries that are striving to achieve a sustainable population. And it can lead by example and show that a stable and decreasing population is economically viable and promotes human well-being, as well as allowing other life forms to thrive. Continuous growth is not compatible with environmental sustainability. And there's growth devouring the earth. Thank you. Thank and, you, uh, Madeline. Is that that's the end, Madeline? Yeah, that's the end. Shall I escape here from the? I, 
I, actually, I don't mind if you keep it up for oh, a second. Okay. I just had a, sure. I had a question. Sure. Well, okay. we're going to go into some, there's been a couple of questions entered in the chat. So David just wrote um, for those, you know, who have any questions, we can queue up in the chat. You can sure. indicate, but I'll, I'll start us off just because um, thank you for the presentation. You know, you can see how this topic of population you've touched on a number of different dimensions around, um, you know, labor related things, economic related issues, policy, land use, geography, um, ecology conditions. And I want to go back to the upfront part of your presentation where you had listed the myths. Do you want to go back to sure. that slide? I just want to, um, you know, as if you mean that the premises of um, the premises, yeah, there's looks... like five of them maybe listed together. Yeah, um, that was a powerful visual is... tool to think about. Yeah, so these yeah. policies are based on premises. And so I guess my the question from the other side of this, Madeline, is that these these all of these notions, you know, what you showed was that these are the policies are based on premises and how some of the how some of the policies are made. And then you contrasted that with what gets overlooked or what's not considered in terms of well-being and ero you know uh, erosion of land and things like that. But my question is for a lot of Canada, uh, these premises are almost like um, symbols of what people value and, and, and wrapped in their identities. And not only that, you have a large swath of civil society and entire industries that are dedicated or built on these premises. And I just wonder, what are they, what's, what are they calculating or what are the benefits that they're seeing that allows them to, you know, continue to sustain this and you know, how is it that you reach such a different conclusion? I would, I would push, I would kind of push on that to see how do we make sense of these different conclusions? Okay, well, I think, I mean, I, I use the term propagandized because I have heard um, Century Initiative people interviewed, I've seen like articles in the Globe and Mail, people promoting growth have been interviewed on CBC, and the Globe and Mail uh, would publish articles by P Doug Saunders, John Ibbotson, and um, the authors of, uh, what is it, Empty Planet or, or something, all of them promoting a large population. And the interviewer, I have to say, never asked like questions um, like, what about farmland? Or what about the fact that, you know, we we're, you know, we're lo losing three over 300 acres a day? What about the fact that, um, we're losing species biodiversity. The the numbers of individuals in a lot of species are going down, and and I mean I see it out where I live. Um, I I moved here. I'm living in the same house we lived moved into in 1984, and back then it was the boonies. But development in Ottawa, I think it's doing what what happened in Toronto a few decades ago. It's just it's just massively increasing. You see. As one of my friends said, the most common bird is the crane, the construction crane in Ottawa. Um, I see it happening and I ask why. I remember years and years ago reading this article about, you know, if we do such and such, it will spur development south of Ottawa. I'm wondering, well, why do we need development south of Ottawa? Who is suffering because there is no development outside of or south of Ottawa? Um, you know, why why do we need to keep growing the GDP, that, that's a legitimate question. Why has it become the, the thing, the holy grail, the thing we worship? We must grow the GDP. Why? And, you know, why does, why does the labor force have to grow if, if we're okay with, with the one we have? Um, we're right. sooner or later going to have to stop growing, as Sir David Attenborough says. Population mm -hmm. growth will, will stop. It, we're, we're 8 billion people now. Um, and we've been adding a billion every 12 years or so. Like that's one to the power of nine and every 12 years. It's um, it's a very rapid rate. It's it's basically, well, it is unsustainable. And so are a lot of the a lot of the times in your data points, Madeline, you went back to the historical starting point. And I wondered, so you're so what you're saying is the growth imperative is what is not allowing a lot of these policies to get a more accurate reflection of the effects of the policies. And is that also because those policies are anchored at a different time and place when the when the dynamics at play were at were different? I, I don't know. I mean, we haven't 
we basically have had this source of free energy, which allows us to grow, right? The um, oil, well, not free energy, but abundant energy and and relatively cheap. And from that, I guess our whole eco economic premise now is based on growth. And um, the, the people who benefit from it uh, don't want to change it, don't want to think about changing it, we're going to have to think about changing it. I mean, you know, I have investments too, um, you know, <laughs> but you you have to recognize we have to start rethinking about a steady state economy. There is an organization called um, Association for a Steady State Economy. And um, I think that the Center for the um, something Association for a Steady State Economy, we have to start thinking along those terms because how can we how can we keep growing forever on a finite planet? And wow, how do the powers of me not understand that? I don't understand how they don't understand. <laughs> maybe somebody <laughs> has some idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's where I'll maybe cue in Peter Jones, who's who's entered in a couple of messages and he's done some work in sustainability. Peter, why don't you maybe this is a natural entry point for you to share some thoughts and questions and comments. Oh, well, well, I've really had questions for Madeline about uh, for, around um, your understanding of, of different population segments. I mean, first of all, I am very interested in the economic um, uh, sustainability uh, issue. And, and, I, and my thoughts on, are, you know, to your question are that, I mean, we, we have typical governments that that don't change significantly and have been very much in, you know, whether they're leftish or rightish are still uh, very much based on liberalism, which is a growth philosophy of government. And it isn't going to become, you know, too far right or left that could make the types of kind of um, significant political changes that would be necessary to actually have a either a you know have a significant change that would that would actually change the the economic model um i've been part of of we all canada and the we all being the well-being economic alliance okay. which is uh, an international organization but okay. also the we all canada um organization as well and it's it was exploring the, these questions over the last couple of years or a few people like me that are involved or interested in ecological economics as well. And, and they've made recommendations, you know, to actually through federal government and everything as well. We don't have power though. And so that's what I mean. It really is a philosophy of liberalism to, to proceed it to, um, to, uh, you know, to uh, push progress and progress has been based on growth to make a strong argument, even against that. We're going against the inertia of, of, of really thousands of people that are very much part of, you know, not just a, not just the elites that you know that come and go within government and leadership positions, but the hundreds of thousands of, of people that are well aligned with that, as well as you know. The, you know, banking institutions and investment and development, there's a significant amount of power there. Oh, absolutely. And so not. intellectuals like us don't have that much power to, we can make good arguments and they're like, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I, my, uh, and, and in a similar way with climate change, you know, you know, one of the orientations to sustainability is to prepare to deal with effects as they occur to have a very to have better policies for mitigation and adaptation as we can develop them because policies based on 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 hope and and intervention that we can't actually execute can sometimes be um i mean they you know we can like with we all we can build you know very good proposals and and make and, and even get them heard Mm -hmm. um, you know, within government, but are they going to be, are they going to land? Are they going to be effective? Are they going to take shape? And what do we do when we know when they don't? But so, it, know, seems, so. it seems that in recent years, this has been pushed even more because 
because this this liberalism or these policies, as you say, have been hundreds of years since, well, building since the Industrial Revolution. But in the last year of Pierre Trudeau's government, I think he only took in like 87,000 immigrants because of, of the state of the economy. So it was low. And we saw that in the, you know, Canada's first 100 and some years, um, immigration levels went up and down depending on the state of the economy. And during the mm. depression in the 1930s, hardly any were brought in. But now when we're facing a housing crisis and, and quite literally there's, there's heartbreaking stories of people who can't afford their houses anymore and their rent anymore um, because rents are going up and they're living in their car, we're still cranking up immigration and, and something is wrong with that thinking. And then why is the, the Century Initiative not happy with the 250,000, which was already very historically high? And why is it pushing for 100 million Canadians? They, some people are going to get very rich from that, but it's, it's not going to be the average working Canadian and, and certainly not recent immigrants because they, they suffer the most when uh, the, more come in because there's more competition for their jobs. So it seems that yes, it drives wage levels down, and it makes yeah. the competent the uh, access to housing even more difficult, which and makes it a problem even in the smaller cities, which it wasn't uh, before. Exactly, and, exactly. And I, I have an article about uh, people leaving Toronto and mm. and going to other cities. I mean, the, Toronto is still growing rapidly, but as as immigrants pour in and densification happens, and you know people don't like their neighborhoods anymore, they're moving to smaller towns. And now they're driving up the prices in, in those smaller towns. They're driving up the, the housing costs and everything. And I know it's happening even in provinces that used to be relatively cheap or in, in low cost in terms of housing. Um, but it, they've gone up quite a bit too. Uh, my brother lives in New Brunswick and real estate prices there are rising rapidly as you know refugees from Toronto and well refugees from Ontario as they're called <laughs> you mean Canadian refugees that's right Canadian refugees <laughs> um come in so so why like why what is the goal what is the yeah. goal and do people like the century initiative never have enough money I mean um I, I don't know it seems to be uh, so David Hawk has has some good insight on this from his understanding as an ecological economist and for, from George Eskew uh, you know, work and, and entropy in economic systems. But you know, I, I think it's clear to the ecological economists that when we look at what how economic policy, and I won't say theory, just policy is very much driven by those that are, you know, have, who have current responsibility for, for, for those policy decisions only know to do this. You know, I mean, so they aren't going to bring in, ex, you know, experiments that, that they might feel could have an existential risk of, of the type of collapse that they know is possible. In other words, there is there is a, something of a Ponzi scheme as well. That is this Absolutely. kind of perpetual motion creation of, of economic capital or of financial capital that is derived further, that is less and less connected to the real economy. That's what becomes Ponzi-like or, yeah. you know, or yeah, yeah, that, it's, expanded. It's, and so when you show the chart of mortgages um, now, you know, reaching or even exceeding the level of the real economy in terms of its its, its annual output, and that's probably a pretty good measure of showing that you know we've derived our our economy beyond its its productive capacity, and so it's it's a it's a weird kind of growth that is making a, that's making it economically and sustainable. So what they do are doing is throwing more bodies at it. Mm -hmm. David, David might have a suggestion on this, but you know, I, I'm a believer in the steady state approach. I like Peter Victor's work, and I think yeah. there is a, you know, I'm not a deep growther. I think that we need to change the proportion of growth in different areas. That's why I'm curious about like population pockets, the growth of First Nations communities, the distribution of growth in different areas that could reduce the pressure for, you know, in places that is exporting, mm -hmm. um, you know, exporting high-priced 
you know, um, housing all over the country. Basically, we need more of a real economy within the co within the population that we already have. Well, I, I think that's true. You're talking, and and John Mayer of Canadians for Sustainable Society also talks about the money economy versus the real economy, and the real economy is based on biophysical reality, which in the end we will all have to contend with because money we only believe in money i mean money only works because we believe in it but um when there's no more resources what are we going to do I'm, <laughs> um and then we'll have this and what are we going to we're going to have this huge population and then what i mean are they thinking of the and then what um uh, <laughs> When we have 100 million Canadians, then what? Are we going to, is everybody yeah. going to be happy? Yeah. Toronto is supposedly going to go from whatever it is now, like the GTA, 7 million or whatever, it's going to go to 35 or some insane, totally insane number. They have a, a, a booklet where they, or a document where they talk about this, and it, it just makes no sense to me. So sorry, Mylan, I'll let Peter cue it up David Hawk. So I don't want to disrupt the natural flow sure. of commentary. So, but also David Ng, if I take off in 10 minutes, you can hop in and continue moderation. Madeline, I'll catch up with you later. But David Hawk, if you have Peter set you up for some comments, so why don't you take the floor? Maybe a couple. Uh I'm far more pessimistic than anyone that has spoken so far. <laughs> which means that I'm actually quite optimistic. Uh, that means that at the last university that fired me, the student body asked me to give a go away lecture, which I did. And my go away lectures usually are on it's too late. <laughs> and so there's a lot of optimism and it's too late because while it's becoming too late in, in my experience in history, the leaders always go underground and go into hiding because they don't want to be caught and barbecued right. or hung or whatever for what they've done. Right. So during that time, there's a tremendous possibility of doing some really great things. Uh, my second point and the point relative to doing something after it's too late is to go back to that Osbacon idea of getting rid of national boundaries. And so then much of what you're concerned about, Madeline, would be changed rather radically by not having a national boundary to protect. So simply allow world citizens to roam in the world and try to make sense of it as sort of a last ditch effort to try and keep some humanity. But you'll well, notice whenever I comment, it's mostly based on the idea of climate change already is well underway and is not gonna be reversed and not even going to be slowed for some time. Maybe in 2050, we'll get a little more serious, but oh, not yeah. now. I, I I was advising the world's largest construction company for 15 years and convinced them that their agenda should be getting rid of airplanes and automobiles. And lo and behold, they did buy into it. I, I can't go into details, but billions, if not trillions, have been invested in laying the groundwork to get rid of cars and airplanes. How and so at least 20 years they've been on board with that very radical idea, which is almost against their national government. I, I, I'm just, how, how do you see government happening in a, in a world without borders? I haven't. Oh, trouble. it would be buried. Thank God. It would go away. What, what do you mean government? <laughs> so we'd be, we'd <laughs> revert to, we'd revert to, we, we would revert to tribalism, you mean, or? Well, if you'd like, sure, or hunting parties. It's up to you. Hunting parties are better than tribalism. So we, well, I but think we would revert to tribalism. So in order to defend anything, like without government, there'd be no police well, force. we don't do it police. now. I mean, we don't defend now that police are more of an irritant than a defending mechanism. Well, I think, I think they, they're... <laughs> There's still more of a defense than if there you we see the looting in places like California where the government the governor has um declared that crimes under a thousand dollars don't won't be uh, prosecuted so uh, hey, stores are leaving I, <laughs> more Californians I mean, left than than arrived I mean, to be, actually. yeah to, to be more succinct I would just encourage you to go read some of Prigozhin and uh and then also read uh, Mutual Aid by Kropotkin 
where in essence, when people get in really dire straits, they start working together as opposed to what they do now, right. which is the Adam Smith routine connected to Darwin, that we have to get over those two routines. Hmm. And then we don't need so many police, we don't need so much government, et cetera, et cetera. And in essence, the government sets up uh, national defense forces to protect their leaders, not to protect have, them from other countries. Have, have there been um, any any um, societies without government, uh, as we understand government, that were not tribal, that were not tribal sure, sure. oriented, yeah. that did not sure. did not before the, before the Greeks and the Italians? Sure, mm -hmm. of course, they're the ones that established the hierarchies, and then. Mm -hmm. Everything well, was done I, to protect the hierarchy. I think, um, I think, I think we, other animals have hierarchies as well. So I think it's a little optimistic mm -hmm. to think that there'd be no, no hierarchies with, uh, with no government. No, no, that's why I told you to read uh, Kropotkin, because <laughs> Kropotkin talked about the silliness of Darwin being on a desert, on an island, watching animals like to kill and eat each other. Whereas in Siberia, they didn't have that luxury because rabbits and foxes huddled together to protect themselves from the cold. So in essence, and my third hmm. point, and I'll what, shut up. But the third the point eat? is that we're already going to rapidly change where the first industry, and I gave a Zoom call on this to the industry leaders a few days ago. The first industry to go away will be insurance. The insurance will hmm. disappear because of climate change, uh, no company can afford to insure anybody for any reason. Mm. The second industry will be mortgage industries. That will go away as well. So we'll end up with a very different slate to look at. And in essence, we'll have a very different basis. In, in essence, uh, nationalism will dissolve along with these industries dissolving, whether we like it or not. So nature, in essence, will come back and establish a different order that we seem not to be but, able to. But uh, if nationalism goes, tribalism might remerge because there were there tribes fought one another, you know, in prehistory and in on the continents. You know, all of all of the um, Aboriginal tribes in North America didn't all get along swimmingly. It's exaggerated. Tribalism is nationalism. Look at Florida and Texas. Well, well, it is. Um, I mean, nationalism is a, is a form of tribalism. It's it's sort of tribalism mm, exactly. to an ideal as opposed to a an ethnic group only. It, it's sort of a a, a wider, I guess, um, a tribalism. But uh, you know, to, I, I don't see how if the system is global, there won't there won't be you know tyrants mm. that want to arise. I I just don't see it all becoming sweetness and light. You know, in that sense, but it won't. Nature will treat, will teach you about that. You'll learn. Okay. Um, could, no I, think, I, I think we're going to move on. Madeline, could we? Could you uh, turn off your screen share? Oh, sure. And and, um, and we'll move on. So the the sequencing of questions. Uh, Stephen Ragosi had some questions. Then Griff. Then Donald. And then I may get one in after that. So Stephen. Yes. Well, thank you very much uh, for this. I mean, to me, this is a rare opportunity to ask some crucial questions about the Francophones and the Anglophones in Canada. Mm. Because obviously the growth of the Francophone population traditionally has always been a major issue in the history of Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, the Francophones refuse to recognize the Allophones. Now, the allophones uh, kind of looking at us in this particular group, uh, I think the proportion of allophones in this group is approximately the same as the proportion of allophones in Canada. Hmm. And that's, of course, is very interesting. I'm an immigrant myself. I've only been in Canada for 60 years. Hmm. Uh, but the French language versus the English language issue in Canada really interests me. So the question is this, what is the proportion of allophones in Canada? Uh, I, I raised this issue with Statistics Canada. They kind of laughed at me. Uh, I also wanted to know about Francophiles, for example. So because you know about population issues, 
Are you able to tell us about the allophone component of Canada? Well, I can look here very quickly. <laughs> and it says 98% um, of Canadians speak one of the official languages, but um, I don't exactly know what the percentage of, of uh, allophones is, but I do know that um, so immigrants now make up approximately a quarter of, of the population, right? And many of them will might have another language than English or French as their first language because um, most immigrants no longer come from Europe. So um, like I, my, I myself officially, my mother, my my dad is a was um, long term Canadian for se for several generations in the Ottawa area. Uh, my mother actually was from Germany, so she was an immigrant. So one of my parents was an immigrant, and she spoke German to her kids. Um, so according to the census, my first language, which I you know first learned and still understand, is German. So I, I don't know. Am I an allophone? I'm I'm an anglophone. But um, I, I I don't know what the proportion of allophones is. Um, so so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm well, guess. thank you very much. Because you see, this is an important data point. Mm -hmm. uh, an important data point that one of the most fundamental components of Canadian culture is being systematically ignored mm -hmm. to the extent that even you, do not have the information on this subject. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally puzzled by this. English is my third language. French is my fourth, fourth language mm -hmm. uh, because I worked at it. I'm Hungarian by background, uh, and uh, the the allophone population of Canada, I would say, is anywhere between twenty five percent to thirty three percent. Mm. And the Anglos and the Francos bashing each other uh, is going on uh, through the, ignoring the elephant population altogether. So thank you very much for the data point. <laughs> yeah, you're you're mm. welcome. I mean, I, it's an interesting question. How do they how do they count elephant? Um, but I think Griff Griff wants to jump in uh, and may have mentioned something in the chat, Griff. Yeah, so just to answer your question, Stephen, you had asked that earlier, uh, and then I went digging and I posted it. I actually ended up editing Wikipedia because the data on Wikipedia was <laughs> so you're right. You're right in that, um, yeah, it's still not up to date, but I did find a page that's comparing um, allophone to English and French, and the current is 24.2% is allophone. How they define it, I don't know. I didn't get into the details around like exactly what you're saying in terms of definitions, English is 58, French is 20.9, and then uh, Indigenous is 0.5%. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting that they don't count. Uh, um, it's in, sorry, okay. It's interesting that they don't count uh, multiple languages. In other mm -hmm. words, polyglots are being ignored. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they, I'm not sure if that's correct or not, because I did look and see there's a bunch of different tables that have different makeups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. pretty, yes, I know those tables. Yes. Yeah, that's just like above my head in terms of figuring all that out on the spot. Sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the point is that the Anglos and the Francos bashing each other is, is such a major item that the polyglots are being ignored. But thank you very much for the yeah, for the confirmation of that. Griff, should you move on to your own questions? Um, sure, okay. So uh, thanks for the talk, really interesting stuff. A um, couple of things that kind of uh, jump out for me. Um, and I guess, the, I guess the main thing that I would love to see in like another revision um, of your talk, it's, I guess it's sort of similar to Stephen in some ways, is like to drill down into some of the data and, and understand specific municipalities or even neighborhoods and what is happening to um, populations in those areas. Uh, and the reason I ask that is um, my understanding of patterns of immigration is that they tend to, uh, most immigrants prefer to move to a place where there's shared language and culture and all these other obvious things. Um, 
makes perfect logical sense. And of course, when you combine that with sense of space and buildings, well, now you've got you know a very tight and densely packed community in, in a couple of square blocks that might not actually have room, like a place to grow uh, out because it's bumping noses with some other community. Um, and so for me, this is sort of something I'd love to see is just understand if we're talking about growth and populations and pressures, like where are these, these little pressure points around the country? Um, and then conversely, are there, are there municipalities or um, other areas that are actually uh, depopulating um, long-term? You know, we, we often heard that about Nova Scotia, for example. I think that's kind of turned around recently. I used yeah. to live in Nova Scotia. Um, I think that's kind of turned around recently. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I sent that little example map of the United States, which was just the past year. So I don't know how much stock I put in that, but um, showing some rates of depopulation in, in almost half of U.S. counties are experiencing depopulation, probably for these same reasons that I'm highlighting this, this tendency for, for folks to sort of congregate in particular areas. So that's kind of interesting to me in the long run. Um, and then combining those questions would be where my mind goes is immediately into what David's question was, which is around climate refugees. Um, and like, if we can expect that, which I think we probably reasonably can, um, are those patterns going to persist? And so now you're going to have potentially large influxes of people um, going to these relatively small areas. Um, and like, has anyone done any preparation on that at all? I, I, I have a feeling they probably haven't, um, so. but that concerns me. Um, and then also sort of like the ethical implications of that. Like if we can expect it, you know, what can we possibly do um, if anything? And then tied to that same question, is uh, I think Bev no, uh, mentioned, I think is very valid to consider. I've seen a lot of reports recently. I don't know the data, I'm not that familiar with it, around um, like global depopulation basically, just concerns in various countries that um, populations are starting to plateau and possibly will drop off and that that has all kinds of impacts. And, mm -hmm. and so just, just wondering, you know, how, how do these things connect to you? You know, so, so I'm asking you to connect municipality to global trends, but. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. I know that th there's a fellow um, uh, now deceased, but Martin Collicott, who was a Canadian diplomat um, married to a Vietnamese woman, I think. And he uh, was concerned about high immigration levels as well. He was married to an immigrant, but he, mm -hmm. um, and he uh, had published about the number of, you asked about a people of, of one place sort of um, congregating in an area. Um, he, he talked about ethnic enclaves is when you get 70% mm -hmm. or more of um, a, a particular area of, of one ethnic group or one, and it used to be like Canada, which was, um, you know, until about 1970, very much primarily of British descent and, and French descent with some European thrown in. Mm. in. I think in 1980, it only had six ethnic enclaves. And then in, in, in 20 something or other, it had 280 some ethnic enclaves, which is sort of neighborhoods with 70% um, or more of a partic particular ethnic or whatever group, religious group or national group. So I, I know that these these congregations do happen. I, I don't know, you know, what percentage of the cities are what. I know that, you know, Toronto is now, um, it's it's white majority minority or min minority majority or whatever, because most immigrants mm -hmm. did go to, did congregate in, in Toronto. And then in Vancouver, I remember when the, the Hong Kong um, handover was happening, um, it got a, it got a very large influx of, of people from Vancouver, and I think I seem to recall reading that about one tenth of the population of Hong Kong went to Vancouver or something. A very very large nice. number of people there. Um, so there are a lot of ethnic enclaves, um, and and as for the the whole population thing and and climate thing and and global population, Canada cannot solve. Um, the world's overpopulation problem. Because it recently, in recent years, the population had been growing by 80 million annually. It's down to 67 million, which is a good thing, um, but it, it you know should be lower. And even taking in 
you know, half a million to a million last in 2022, apparently Canada got um, 1 million permanent and non-permanent immigrant uh, uh, residents. So some of them are temporary, but, you know, they're in Canada now and still need housing. Um, and even with that, we are, we're straining at the seams, things are falling apart. So we, you know, we can't expect to take a, a large, huge number of immigrants and, and solve problems that way. Um, the, the One of the videos for the suggested pre-reading of the one by Roy Beck, it, I think it illustrates that very well. It refers to the U.S., but the same applies to Canada. Um, when people come to Canada, Canada has one of the highest per capita um, greenhouse gas emission rates in the world. It's higher than in the U.S., and it's uh, just below a few of the Arab Emirate countries with a lot of oil and mm -hmm. a lot of riches. Uh, because we have a cold climate, and everybody needs to heat their house, even in Victoria. Mm -hmm. You have days that go below zero. So um, John Mayer of Canadians for a Sustainable Population calculated these, what were the units, in terms of residential um, energy in, what, intake, what, what, can they, uh, what are they using? And in India, it was very low. It was two um, whatever kilowatt hours per, I, I, I forget the units, but it was two. And in Canada, it was 34. So in India, and I mean, I, I lived in, in Pakistan for two years and it, it gets hot there. Um, mm. And their people had a lot of ceiling fans. And if you open the windows or whatever in a certain way, you could actually keep a room reasonably cool. And not that people don't use air conditioners, which uses a lot of energy. And I know sometimes in India it goes to what forty degrees, or you hear these insane, insanely hot temperatures. Um, you'll want air conditioner, but still, in, you can get away with using less energy in warmer climates than you can in a in a climate like Canada. And John calculated that on average, the a newcomer to Canada increases their GHG emissions by a factor of four. Well, actually, the number he got was four point two which coincides with a U.S. study published in 2008, which found that the average newcomer to the U.S. increases their GHG emissions by a factor of four. Because again, in both countries, most of the immigrants come from um, warmer countries or countries where they actually use le less per capita energy. So in a way, I mean, bringing people to this country increases their GHG emissions. And I don't think it's it's feasible. I mean, um, even the UN in its 1994 um, International Conference on Population and Development, the the program of action that arose from that in the preamble, it says that every country has to um, attend to its, its population issues by itself. I mean, it can't expect other countries to you know take to take their excess population. I, I don't think that's feasible. And if if already, I mean, already that is happening to a certain extent. For for example, the Philippines, um, Egypt, and Haiti have mm. each exported. I'm going to say exported 10% of their population. So and they have high growth rates. And I know the president of Egypt is very concerned about it. But um, even with that, even with this, it's a safety valve. And that allows business as usual to continue in the sending country because it it might reduce the incentive of governments to actually meet the needs of their people and do something about the, the growing population. When I lived in Pakistan in the 1960s, it had 60 million people and now it has um, what 220 million or something. So that's a that's a massive, a massive, massive increase. And I remember in 2011 when there were those floods and um, 20 million people were displaced in Pakistan. And I was thinking, well, if their population had remained at 20, at 60 million, there wouldn't be 20 million people displaced now because they wouldn't have to live on a floodplain because they wouldn't be so crowded. So um, th these countries are going to have to ad address their population growth. And a lot of them are. I mean, India has just become, uh, just reached the replacement level of, of about two kids per woman. And, and most countries in the world are at or reaching a, a replacement level. So population will decrease. Now it's still, birth rates are still very high in sub-Saharan Africa, even though I think they've just come down below five kids per woman, but that's still, that's still very high. And most of the 2 billion people that are expected, Africa's now got 
a population of about 1.3 billion. And it's hard to believe that in 1900, it only had 100 million. And now it's um, 1.3 billion expected to be 2 billion by 2050 and 4 billion by 2100. If, if current trends, well, if projections are accurate, and of course, projections don't take into account things like collapse or, or, or whatever um, that we cannot predict. But I think we're just going to have to go through this bottleneck of a, of first an aging population while baby boomers like me die off, and and then a shrinking population. So we are going to go with a you know be top heavy with old people for a while, but I uh, you know I I don't see that has to be a bad thing. Um, no. a, a tighter <laughs> labor a tighter labor market and <laughs> maybe better wages for the people still working. Yeah. But, um, let's let's turn to Don uh, because you had some I, comments earlier on. Sure, I did. Um, my uh, instinct, I should tell you, is to be a little bit angry about this whole uh, <laughs> this whole approach because I think um, I, I think a country like Canada needs more people to protect it for one thing, to create a how should I say, critical masses in many areas so we can do things here and not export our best people all the time, which we do a lot of. Uh, I think we're, uh, we're kind of a sluggish society and have been for quite a while. Maybe that's part of being post-colonial. But I think really I'm looking at the whole world uh, as being in a state of relative stagnation. Um, I comment I made was, was that some analysts are predicting population collapse worldwide. Now, you've probably heard of that. I haven't heard much of it in the last few months, but I have, it keeps coming back. Because people, when they get a little bit wealthier or a little bit more secure, they don't have to have dozens of children because lots of them will die off and they need the rest of them to support them in their old age. Tell that to Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he, I know he has a lot of children. But um, <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. But no, that's not just Elon Musk. There's a lot of people who have said that. And uh, and I've seen some statistics on the subject. I'm sorry I can't quote them right now because it was a while back and I thought it was quite shocking. Well, But I guess um, what we need is an enormous growth in the use of the imagination and the use of energy. And, and by the way, real science, real science, you know, the stuff that really doesn't just simply adapt things has fallen off enormously in the last 30, 40 years. There are some very insignificant bright points and some slightly scary ones, too. But for the most part, that is that is a disturbing fact. We are uh, a world, well, certainly the civilized, so-called civilized world is full of rent renters right and rent not only renting out but being making money from rents of all kinds and a lot of this uh, inflation is due to simply people um capitalizing on scarcity uh it's it's the entire system which 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 really has to be has to be shifted i believe and uh, that, that usually comes from pressure and there's in the historical record, in the archaeological record, there are lots of cases where human beings in many, many parts of the world, I'm thinking of um, Graeber's book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, which I found was quite fascinating. And it, the story is that we have a lot more uh, versatility and a lot more capacity to change than we, than we usually follow. But because we've had it kind of soft and easy, really, since the end of World War II, we haven't cultivated that. So we're in a state of decay and stagnation in well, a sort of cultural sense. Whatever state we're in, we do need natural resources. And we are using oh, yeah. them at an at a unsustainable um, rate. I mean, we humans are now 30 over 30% of the mammalian biomass on earth. So if you add mm -hmm. up the weight of all the mammals and our cattle yeah. and pigs and pets and stuff are about 60 some percent. So between the two of us, the, between humans and their animals, yeah. uh, we are over 96% of the mammalian biomass and wild mammals are only 4%. Like we have just basically wow. taken over the entire earth. And as I see it, we are turning 
the earth into a feedlot for humanity and mm -hmm. why do we want to do that why why do we need more humans i mean isn't eight billion enough well, i'm just talking about <laughs> um, canada <laughs> yeah, okay well and um yeah and i i don't see how having more people will make canada better because it's not going to make the the cold parts of it any warmer and people are still mm -hmm. going to congregate in the habitable parts and we i no. think saving our farmland is more important than um you know what whatever whatever it is we're doing if we i mean we're not you talk about defense or whatever but we're not putting any money into defense we're not putting any no money we're not no but we that's don't, a big you know, problem one of the reasons people. there's nobody to become soldiers okay but we don't well i think there's there's a, there's possibly a, a lot of reasons but i think if we want to be serious about defense we have to be serious about um equipment and i don't see yeah. that having more more people would do that and also you um earlier you you mentioned the um well, you didn't say the words demographic transition theory but that is what you were referring to about when people right. get get wealthy they they have fewer kids there is a correlation with that but um actually what seems to Jane O'Sullivan at Queensland University in Australia actually looked at the time scale of when these things happened and she compared countries that were comparable in wealth and population in 1970 mm -hmm. She paired, uh, compared um, pairs of two countries and then how they evolved. And she found that actually what happened is that a, a smaller, a lower fertility rate, like when the total fertility rate fell between three and two kids per woman, is when the, uh, the, uh, the per capita wealth increased, not mm -hmm. vice versa. And um, so she compared when China started taking off with India, um, mm -hmm. she compared Syria with Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And Tunisia had a, a a drop in fertility, way Syria is still high, um, and its its wealth took off. She compared Costa Rica, I think, with Guatemala, and yeah. then there was another, and and Thailand with the Philippines. And Thailand yes. and the Philippines had the same population and per capita wealth approximately in 1970. And then Thailand really put the brakes on on its population growth, and it has done quite well economically. The, Thai, the Philippines are still a lot poorer. Um, yeah. That's true. Well, I think there has to be a critical mass for things to get done in a country, for science to move forward, for technology to become more intelligent. And we have, um, we used to have a pretty good education system. I think it's in rough shape right now. And all that happened with a much lower population. So if we could do it with a lower population then, uh -huh. then why couldn't we have a lower population n now? I mean, you know, we, we, I know Diefenbaker killed it, but the Avro Arrow in aviation yeah. was apparently quite impressive. And we were at that time. Yeah. Side. Yeah. But now it takes more people to do things because of the co competition worldwide. Do you want us to become Japan? Is that maybe a good model? Um, Japan, in terms of, of, of population. Uh, well, Japan is doing not that badly. I mean, it does have mm -hmm. a lot of old people, but yeah. But it's, they I think Japan is doing much better than uh, the burgeoning African countries with a very, very high well, sure. population. Yeah, they had systemic problems there. Un yeah. Unemployment there is very, very high. I, mm -hmm. I remember reading about Egypt and, um, you know, a lot of these young people have university educations and pretty much no hope of getting a, a decent job, which is yeah. discouraging. Um Okay. Not so, remember years ago, I was at a, a gas station anyway. in, in Ottawa, and I didn't know it was a, a full serve. But these three young people were were serving me. One was filling the tank, one was cleaning my windows, one was checking the oil, and they were discussing among themselves what universities they had attended. And I thought that was so sad. You know. Wow. Yeah. We're we're winding down to the uh, to the end of the meeting. Um, I promised uh, Bev that she'd have an opportunity to speak if she. Oh, she's shaking her head. <laughs> okay <laughs> um so um so we're gonna wrap up then um so uh, madeline thanks for the talk um the the presentation slides are posted um you can find uh uh can find you online quite easily um i'm going to actually now uh, advertise the next session of system thinking ontario because I, I we're ahead of the curve we're actually the uh, eventbrite is now open so next month, based off the response that we had from the previous month, um, we're going to have a discussion about the Sustainable Development Goals 
from someone who actually works in the UN and who's a graduate of uh, the SFI program, um, right. Ned Rava. So um, it'd be fun to see everyone next week. Um, dispel cool. any any um, questions or myths or whatever. Like you have one a person to ask, he'll be the person to ask. That, so that's, uh, so that's next week? Date on that? Uh, that is on May the 8th. Okay. I'll be away, but... But I'll look mm -hmm. at it online. That'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the second Mondays, unless we can't do them, then it's third Mondays. But uh, we do record them. I guess we don't always post the videos, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to find yours. I, I do mine on YouTube, but I haven't found your Vimeo, Vimeo one, so I have to find them all, Peter. Hmm. Oh, well, I re I reposted the link. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll see everyone next month then. Thank you, David. You Thanks for inviting Bye. me. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming, Madeline. Great oh, talk. Everybody. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. Very, uh, very stimulating. <laughs>